Hello, and welcome to episode 5 of our open online course for Einstein Summation Convention. If you haven't looked at our consolidation episode, which checks whether you're confident on the content up until now, then click here. We urge you to check this, as the second half of the course requires a secure knowledge of what you've learnt in the first half. The first of the advanced topics we'll look at is a particular tensor, one you won't have seen before, the Kronecker Delta Tensor. So, here's episode 5, let's jump in. We shall first consider how to write the Kronecker Delta symbol. We write it as Delta IJ. So what can we tell about this symbol? From what we've already learned, we can see that it's a second order tensor with indices I and J. Using conventional dimensions for the indices, how many components does the Kronecker Delta have? Okay, so we know what it looks like now, but what makes it special? We define the Kronecker Delta symbol as follows. Delta IJ is equal to 1 if I is equal to J, and is equal to 0 if I is not equal to J. By our standard notation, where I and J are equal to 1, 2, or 3, we can see that the Kronecker Delta only has three components that are not equal to 0. Delta 1, 1, Delta 2, 2, and Delta 3, 3 all equal to 1. So why is this useful? Well, let's recall back to episode 1, where we introduced what a tensor of a certain order was equivalent to. This is where that comes in useful. A second order tensor is equivalent to a matrix, and so the Kronecker Delta tensor is a 3x3 three three matrix, as we can see here. This matrix is special. It is called the identity matrix. Why identity, though? What does that mean? Recall again to episode 1, we defined a second order tensor as a means of changing one vector into another vector. If we multiply any vector by the identity matrix, we get the exact vector we started with. In a sense, its identity does not change. The Kronecker delta has four properties that will be useful to us. See if you can figure out why each one is the case. We'll discuss the reasoning afterwards. Firstly, delta ij is equal to delta ji. Secondly, delta ij aj is equal to ai. Thirdly, delta ii is equal to 3. And lastly, delta ij delta jk is equal to delta ik. So why does each property hold? Let's have a look at the first one. Consider the components. There are always 0 if i is not equal to j, and 1 if i is equal to j. If i and j swap positions, the result is exactly the same. It's best to think about this one in terms of a matrix. We can see that this matrix is symmetrical when looking at it from the top left to the bottom right. For property 2, we show the identity aspect of the Kronecker delta. We can apply matrix multiplication, as shown, to prove that the vector ai remains the same when multiplied by the Kronecker delta. Remember, you don't need to know matrix multiplication for this course. Can you think of what would happen if we wrote ai delta ij instead? Why is order important when we have tensors of different orders? Let's have another look at property 3. This should be easy if you can remember the scalar product from earlier in the course. Have a look at these two identity matrices. We only get non-zero values as we're only multiplying elements in the diagonal. Property number 4 is an extension of what we've already seen. Applying the identity matrix to itself retains the identity. In practice, this can only work if the inner tensor in the product is the same. So in this example, delta ij, delta jk, we have the second tensor of the first delta and the first tensor of the second delta, both being j. OK, let's have a look at some further examples, just to make sure these properties are fully understood. What would happen if we had delta ij, delta ji? Well, using property 4, we get delta ii, which leads us directly into property 3. So delta ij, delta ji is a scalar, 3. What if we had this delta in, aijk? Can we apply property 2? Not yet, because the inner indices of the product aren't the same. But we can apply property 1, which changes i and m around. This then allows us to apply property 2. The result is a m j k. That's almost all for episode 5. Before we finish, let's have a little look over what we covered in this video. 
Are you able to recognize a Kronika Delta symbol? Can you define the Kronika Delta in terms of the relationship between I and J? Can you write the Kronika Delta as a matrix? What type of matrix does it create? Can you name the four properties of the Kronika Delta tensor? Can you apply the four properties to more complicated examples with the Kronika Delta embedded in it? We hope that you're still keeping up with the content for the MOOC. If you're not sure if you understand the Kronika Delta, we recommend you either have another look at this video or read over our summary notes for the episode. If you want to test your knowledge a bit more, have a look at our problem sheet, and if you have any questions, don't forget to check our community forum. That's all for now. Goodbye.